Father, we thank you for the worship time and that beautiful time of just being transported into your presence. And we just would ask now that you would open our hearts, Father, so we can really hear what you want us to hear this morning. Prick our hearts, Father. Make us hungry for these things. Don't let us sit complacently in our seats just learning this as information. But, Father, you just take these words and make them life in each of our lives. Father, we desperately need to know what your supernatural strength is. We need that ability, your ability, to get your will out in our lives. So help us to understand that. And then, Father, this intimacy. We talk about knowing Jesus. We talk about knowing his love. What does that really mean? It's not head knowledge, Father. Head knowledge doesn't do anything for our lives. Help us to understand what that intimacy is so we can just press in for that in all of our lives. And then help us, Father, for the fear of the Lord. We all need to walk in the fear of the Lord, not the fear of man. Most of us are motivated by the fear of man. Teach us, Father, what it really means to walk in fear of you only so that then, Father, we can glorify you in everything that we do. Father, we just ask you to help us to understand this mind of Christ, the phenomenal capabilities that you've given us. They're gifts. We have them. But if we don't understand them, we won't use them. So quicken our understanding. We pray this morning, and we just will praise you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, the fifth function of the mind of Christ. Well, let me give you a quiz. Can you look at me without looking at your papers and give me the first four functions of the mind of Christ? Now, the first one, that you can't, you can't miss the first one, the, brand, the actual tree. The trunk is what? Spirit of the Lord. Right? That, that one I, I would have, that one you need to understand. The Spirit of the Lord. Then out of the Spirit of the Lord come the first two, which is what? Spirit of wisdom is the first one. Spirit of understanding. Then the next one is the Spirit of, of, of counsel. I'm missing. Yeah, that's all we knew. Of, <laughs> I'm flunking it. Spirit of the Lord, Spirit of wisdom, Spirit of understanding, and Spirit of counsel. That's as far as we've gotten. Okay? Those are the first four. And those of you that missed the tape or missed the session last week, do be sure and get that tape to, to catch up with us. So the fifth function, then, of the mind of Christ is the spirit of strength. Now, this spirit of strength goes hand in hand with God's counsel, that supernatural counsel that we talked about last week. It doesn't do you much good Listen to me, ladies. It doesn't do you much good to understand what God's will is for your life if you don't have the supernatural ability to perform it in your life. It doesn't do much good to understand, well, God wants me to do this if you don't have the supernatural ability to, to do it in your life, if you can't work it out. Philippians 2, verse 13 says, For it's God which works in you, not only to will, in other words, counseling you what his will is for your life, but also to do. He's not only in us to will, to show us what his counsel is, show us what his will is, but also to perform it in our lives. He does it both. So the spirit of might or the spirit of strength is God's supernatural power and ability to take what he's shown us, that supernatural will that he's shown us, that counsel, and to do it or perform it in our lives. Why is it so important that God does the willing and also the doing. Why is it important that God must be the one that shows us what his will is and that God must be the one that does it in our lives? Can you guess on that one? It's important because then he's the one that's going to get the glory. He's the one that's going to get the glory. If he shows me what his will is and then I go out there on my own power and ability and perform it, who's going to get the glory? Nancy, whereas if he gives me the counsel and then I say, God, there's no way I can do that. You're going to have to do that through me. People will know that it's God through you and not yourself. And so it's critically important that he does both. Jeremiah 9, verses 23 through 24, validates this. And it says, Thus saith the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his own wisdom, nor let the mighty man glory in his own might, nor let the rich man glory in his own riches. But let him that glorieth glory in this, that he understands and knows me, 
that I am the Lord which exercises loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these things I delight. Let me give you an example. One time I went to teach a class and I felt particularly good about myself. I had just gotten my hair done the day before. I had a new outfit on. I knew the material quite well. And I was very confident. That's always a warning sign. <laughs> okay. And I got up and I started to teach this class. And all of a sudden, it was the Lord who was saying, Are you enjoying yourself? You know? <laughs> and, I mean, this was just going on between us. And I realized that I was out there on my power and my ability performing what he told me to do. And so who would get the glory but him? So you better believe, in the middle, I was conf- you know, confessing my pride while I'm talking. I'm going, giving all of this over. But I know I have come to know the Lord, have that intimacy, so I know when it's me and I know when it's him. And you'll all get there. It'll start slow, but you'll know when it's you coming forth and you'll go puke. You know, and you'll turn around and you'll get it back. It is. It's revolting because it's so glorious when God does it through you. So that's, that's why he needs to do both. First Peter 4 or 5 says, If a man speaks, let him speak as of the oracle of God. In other words, speak the words of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability or the strength that God gives so that in all things God will be glorified. And that's the purpose for all of us is so God gets the glory. If people see things in us they like, you want their eyes to be drawn to Jesus. It's Jesus through us. It's not Nancy. It's not your ability, your great speaking ability, your great capabilities. It's Jesus in you. God doesn't need our own abilities. He doesn't need our own strengths. He wants to lay those aside so that he can perform his will through us. Another scripture is great is Zechariah 4, 6. And you've all seen that when it says, not by might, in other words, our own, not by power, our own, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, God's might or God's strength in the Greek means power to reign in. Power to reign, like reign a horse in, power to reign, R-E-I-N, in. Mastery over self. Self-control. I like spirit control. God's might or strength in the Greek means spirit control. And that's just exactly what God's spirit of strength does. It reigns in or brings into captivity our self-life so that God's life can come forth. Spirit of strength reigns in or brings into captivity our self-life, our wild emotions, our uncontrolled thoughts, our self-centered desires, brings that into captivity so that, or sets that aside so that God's life can come forth. When we're going through painful and hurtful circumstances and we make those choices not to go by our wild emotions and our negative thoughts, but to go God's way, he promises you and me he will give us supernatural strength to set those wild things aside so that you can act out of his love and act out of his mind. Let me give you an example that you can probably identify with. Uh, maybe a year or so ago, it wasn't too long ago, there was a very controversial issue going through the Christian body, a very explosive issue, one of many. And um, um, my husband was going to be giving a Bible study on this and covering this particular part of Scripture. And so one night before he gave this study, we were driving the car. I had picked him up at the work, and we were driving in the car. And I started to share with him how I felt on this particular issue. And he was nodding his head, you know, in agreement. And so I thought we were in agreement on this particular issue. So the next day, so the next day, several of my friends, and these happened to be men friends, um, called me up and said, well, how do you guys feel on this particular hot issue? And I said, well, Chuck and I feel this way, right? Chuck and I feel this way. And I said, by the way, Chuck is talking on this issue tonight at his Bible study. Yeah, I'm setting myself up, right? Come come and hear, you know, how we feel. So it would have been probably different if it had been women friends, but it was a couple of men friends. So they came, and my husband teaches a Bible class at Big Calvary. So there were like 500 people in this in this class, and I was like in the first or second row. 
And Chuck starts to talk on this particular issue, and he starts to present the exact opposite viewpoint than what we, I thought we had talked about the night before in the car. Well, I was just aghast. I was just humil, you know how the humiliation starts in the feet and starts coming up <laughs> and, and covers you, and here these two guys are sitting and kind of looking at me like, you know, I thought you said you felt this, and I was just, I was embarrassed, I was humiliated, I almost started to cry, but I figured here it is in my husband's Bible study, if I got up and cried, they'd think something was wrong, <laughs> and there was really nothing to cry about. So anyway, um, we finished the Bible study, and the, and the guys walked out, and I was trying to say, well, I'll talk to Chuck and find out, you know, what, what he really feels, and it was really awkward with these guys, and they left. Luckily, Chuck and I had come in two cars. <laughs> well, how would you have handled that? I mean, you're just built the way I am. You would have even got in the car and broke into tears, or would it, you would have said, you crazy man, or, you know, worse things. And what I needed to do, and this is so important, my sisters, get cleaned up before you confront your husband in love. If you, if I got in the car with Chuck at that moment, he, we wouldn't have spoken to each other for three weeks, I'm sure, because it would have gotten into a battleground. So I knew I needed to get cleaned up. I didn't understand what had happened. I was going to find out, but I wanted to find out in God's um, character and not in my own. So anyway, I got in my car. My car became my prayer closet. And the first thing, now the last session in about four weeks, we're going to spend the entire hour on these four steps practically. How do we renew our minds? And we've gone over those four steps, but we're going to really hit it hard in about four weeks. But simply, I recognize my feelings. I mean, it wasn't too hard to recognize I was angry. You know, first embarrassed, then humiliated, and then angry. <laughs> and I needed to, to really vent those to the Lord. It's just a, critically important that I vent it to the Lord and not to my hubby. Because if you vent it to your hubby, then what happens? They put the walls up and they, they defend themselves and you never get anywhere. You just zero right on down into the pits. So I started to cry. That's the best way with me. It just seems to, if I cry, it just, the truth really comes out. So I started telling the Lord how I felt. I felt betrayed. I felt angry, humiliated, resentful, all the things that any of us would feel in that circum, in that circumstance. Then I said, all right, Lord, go deeper. And what's the root cause here? You know what the root cause was? P-R-I-D-E. P-R-I-D-E. He didn't say what I wanted him to say to make me look good in front of those guys. Bottom line. I want the bottom line. I want to get rid of it. I don't want to keep, you know, pussyfooting around. I want to really see my motives. So I confessed to God that all these feelings and everything that I had were obviously not of faith. They were emotional. They were part of my my flesh, and I needed to choose to turn around from following them. If I held on to them, that's what I would act out of when I got home and saw Chuck. I didn't want to do that because I wanted to find out really what happened. And also part of that step, I unconditionally forgave Chuck. I needed to do that without understanding what had happened or why he did that. I needed at that point unconditionally to say I forgive him from embarrassing me for all of these things. And the third step, I gave all those things that God had shown me over to the Lord and asked the Lord to purge me from them so that by the time I would get home, I would be a clean vessel so that God, you see, with God's love and God's wisdom, that mind of Christ, then I can talk to Chuck and we can really get to finding out what the problem was. And I can remember walking up into the bathroom when I got finally got home, walking up into the bathroom, and I... Ten minutes before, it was only ten minutes from Calvary to our home, ten minutes before, I was wild with emotions. Crying, angry, you know how, just wild. By the time I walked up into that bathroom, I literally experienced God's spirit of strength reigning in that those wild, uncontrolled emotions. And I experienced God's wisdom and God's love coming forth. And it's neat because you can be honest at that point. You can be real at that point. You're not a hypocrite. And I sat down on the on the tub, the side of the tub, and Chuck was getting ready for um, bed. And I and I just shared with him from my side, you know, what had happened, honey. I was really hurt because you presented, you know, this way. But it was out of God's love. So he turned around immediately. If I if I had presented it out of hurt, 
which I had ten minutes before, he would have just put the wall up, said, I'll see you in the morning, I don't need this. You know, husbands just do, just turn off. <laughs> do yours do that? Yeah. I mean, that's what, <laughs> try it this way. Try it this way. And I just sat there, I was honest, but I wasn't accusing, I, I was, I was, there was an acceptance. When you're in God's love and with his wisdom, there's an acceptance. He immediately came over, sat next to me, he said, honey, I'm sorry. He said, I wouldn't have done anything to hurt you. I never hurt you last night. Now, now, <laughs> one lady in one seminar stood up at the back and she said, well, did you get angry at him for not hearing you the night before? You have to understand, my husband turns around chapter 11 companies. He is so, he is a workaholic. He works from six in the morning till eight or nine at night, every night. He is so consumed at work. If I'm not careful and don't watch my timing and go in with my little stuff <laughs> right when he gets in the car when I pick him up, it goes in one ear and out the other ear. And that's obviously what had happened. He had not heard me the night before. And when he said that, I understood. For me, for him, I understood. It had nothing to do with me. It was he just plain was preoccupied and I didn't watch my timing. So immediately it just kind of put the whole thing and we reconciled and then we sat down and talked about this particular hot point and came to a conclusion it was neat because then he could call these guys and talk to them about how we had decided on this particular, on this particular hot issue. But if it hadn't been for God's spirit of strength, I don't think we'd ever gotten that far. Okay? We'd we never gotten as far as the truth. It would have turned into a battleground of emotions. You know what I'm talking about. And, and if you're going at each other from the flesh, somebody stop it because you're going to end up deeper than when you started. Somebody's got to be coming in there with God's love or it's, you're not going to have any results at all. So remember, though, if you're not willing to take every thought captive and renew your mind and you just be carrying on, being carried on by the tide of emotion, don't expect God's spirit of strength to reign in your emotions. He's been quenched. All right. So you're going to just keep acting out of your own thoughts and out of your own emotions and totally in bondage to the power of sin. Do you follow what I'm saying? If you don't choose to give it to God and go through that little ritual there and give those things over... Don't expect the spirit of strength to work. So God's spirit of counsel and strength, the last two, is God's authority and God's power to choose to put off the habits of the flesh and to choose to put on Christ. Critical, critical. God's spirit of counsel and strength is his authority and power to choose to put off the habits of the flesh and to put on Christ. That's right where it happens. And this is the preparation, this is the equipping, this is the cleansing that each of us have to do daily. Listen, it's our responsibility to put off the old. It doesn't happen automatically. Wouldn't it be nice if it did, but it's our responsibility to put off the old and to put on the new. And that's what's going to equip us to fight the battle against the enemy. This is the key to our whole Christian walk. Faith not only to choose God's will, but then faith that God's going to perform that will in our lives. Both. Faith not only to choose, God, I think that you're talking to me, I'm going to choose to follow that, and now I'm going to trust you to love this person through me. I can't stand that person. But I give you a body, I, you know, it's your will to love him, I give you a body, I'm going to expect you to do it through me. This is the victory that overcomes the world that First John talks about. Now, even in the Old Testament, the word for might or strength was gabor, G-I-B-B-O-R. And you know what gabor means in, in uh, the Hebrew? The word for might or the word for strength is gabor in the, in the Hebrew, and it means to overcome. In the actual Hebrew, it means to overcome. The overcomers are the ones that choose God's will. They willingly choose what God's showing them. No matter how they feel, no matter what they want, no matter what they desire, and then they willingly choose to trust God's power to perform it in their lives, no matter how they feel, no matter what they want, no matter what they think. You know what? I have found faith simply comes in the form of a choice. Faith simply comes in the form of a choice. 
So faith is made up of a million choices a day. Faith simply comes in the form of a choice. I have chosen to follow God's counsel, and then I have chosen to allow him to perform it in my life. Now, I call God's spirit of of, uh, counsel and might God's supernatural willpower. God's supernatural willpower. And we talked about that in the way of agape, and we're going to talk again next week about God's supernatural willpower. It's the key to our whole Christian walk. The ability to put off the habits of the flesh and the capability of putting on the mind of Christ. Now, let me detour for just a minute. We've been talking about God's supernatural counsel and God's supernatural might, which he's given us as gifts of the Holy Spirit. Let's talk a moment about our free choice. That little thing in there that I wish that it had almost left out of my makeup. That free choice. I have the free choice, and so do you, to follow God's will and to trust his ability to perform it or not. And so do you. Our free choice is critical because our choices decide whose life is going to be lived in our soul. Our choices are, our choices are critical because they decide whose life is going to be lived in my soul. Is it God's life that's going to be shown forth out here? If so, I will have made faith choices and God's life is able to pour forth. If I make an emotional choice where I'm saying I'm hurt too much or I just can't do this, Lord, I'm quenching God's life and what's going to be shown forth out here is self-life again. So we have the free choice constantly to follow God's instructions and rely upon his ability to perform it. Thus, God's life will be manifested Or we constantly have the free choice to follow our wild emotions and negative thoughts and thus whose life is going to be manifested out here? Our own. Our own. I think born-again believers are the only ones that have free choice. Born-again believers are the only ones that have free choice. You know why? Why? because they're the only ones that have the power of the indwelling spirit within them. We have a power to perform something different, whereas a non-believer doesn't have that. So we don't have to be carried on by the tide of emotion like a non-believer does, because they have no other power source within them to perform something different. So there's no other choice for them. They have to be carried on with their emotions. They have to be carried on with their own thoughts. They have to act out of those. They have no other power supernatural power within them to perform something different. But we have something special. We have God's spirit within us that gives us God's authority and God's power, and listen to me, to go against how we feel, against what we think, and against what we want to do. We have the supernatural power and ability to choose to go against what I think, what I feel, what I want in the flesh. And I call this a contrary choice. This is just a word, just a phrase that I coined because it's a choice that's contrary to what I feel, what I think, and what I want. And I live by contrary choices. My flesh is yanking me to go this way, and I'm saying, no, I know Matthew 26, 39 tells me I I can say like Jesus, not my will, not my emotional feelings, but yours, God. And all I need to do is say that, and then God will take it from there. So the neat part about this is you can be honest with God, and you can say to him, I hate this person right now. I can't love this person right now. I don't want to love this person right now. He's hurt me too much. But then you can say, Lord, I know I have your authority and your power to make a contrary choice, and that's all you require from me. You need a body. You need a willing body, and you'll do the rest. Do you understand? You don't have to love those people. You don't have love for those kinds of people. Only Jesus has love for those kinds of people. All he needs from you is a willing and an open and a cleansed vessel. So if you make contrary choices and be honest with God and tell him how you really feel, but then at the end say, but I'm willing to give you those feelings, all right, Then he says, thank you, that's all I need from you. You're clean, and he'll love that person through you. And when he does that, and you see it be him, and you see 
and hear things come from your mouth and it's not hypocrisy. It's genuine and you know it's genuine. You're going to want to stay there. You're going to want to get back and stay there because it's, it is the abundant life. It is God flowing through you. It's an incredible gift. All we need to do is be willing. God does the rest. Be willing and clean. It's an incredible gift of the Holy Spirit. Let's look back on chart number five. I think that should be last, um, the first part of, of last week. Let's just review what we've learned so far before we go on to the last two functions of the mind of Christ. Okay, we learned that God's Spirit is the power source. That was the trunk, remember? That's the power source that's going to create the mind of Christ within us. Then we learned that God's wisdom were all of God's supernatural thoughts right here. God's wisdom are all of his supernatural thoughts. He's already placed in our hearts if we're born again. God's understanding, we talked about, was his supernatural enlightenment. His, he turns on the lights for us. Supernatural enlightenment or illumination. Supernatural illumination to his word. And we need that desperately. It doesn't do you any good to have God's wisdom sitting on your lap if you don't have understanding of it. Then we talked about God's counsel. God's counsel is his personal instructions. Personal instructions here, right? Personal instructions right here to help us make godly choices. He's prompting us and saying, go this way, do this, go this way. And you, you'll get so keen to hear his voice. And then we just talked about supernatural strength, which is God's power to carry those instructions out in our life. Now, notice these first five, these first five functions of the mind of Christ, okay, are supernatural gifts. They're supernatural gifts that the Lord has given us. They're always available to us. Okay, all we need to do is make the right choices. Make the right choices, and they're available to us. But there's something special about the next two functions of the mind of Christ, which is uh, spirit of knowledge we're going to talk about and the fear of the Lord. Something special. It's our responsibility, okay, daily to achieve intimate knowledge of God and to walk in the fear of God. There's a, a special responsibility that, that each of us um, need to, to achieve in order to have these two last gifts. I really believe some Christians go all their Christian life and never experience intimate knowledge of God and never walk in the fear of God. They know God, they have God in their heart, they have all of these supernatural functions, but there's something special, and you'll see as we, we learn about them. <clears throat> most of us walk only knowing about Christ, we don't know him personally, and most of us walk in the fear of man and not in the fear of God. So these last two endowments of the Holy Spirit, okay, come not only as we make faith choices, but then we must lay our lives down moment by moment as living sacrifices not only make those faith choices but now moment by moment lay our lives down and I think this is what Philippians 2 verse 12 is talking about have you ever seen Philippians 2 12 it says work out your salvation with fear and trembling have you ever seen that ever wondered what that meant work out your salvation with I thought that everything was done for us for us I thought it was all by grace and we we were saved what is he talking about work out your salvation with fear and trembling the working out I believe is the next two functions of the mind of Christ and that's daily and this is our responsibility and we'll see in 2 weeks again how this is validated by the temple model so let's talk about now the spirit of knowledge which is just a critical, critical message. This is the sixth function of the mind of Christ, spirit of knowledge. Spirit of knowledge is not intellectual knowledge. And, you know, gals, if you're trying to follow me on the uh, outlines, I don't follow those outlines. So you might just... I told you that on the first. I forget there's new people here. So the, But just take notes as the Holy Spirit leads on the back of it or something like that, and then later on maybe fill in. But um, those are old notes. They've got scriptures for you, 
but I don't, you know, they're not up to date on some of the new material. So it'd be better just to listen and let the Holy Spirit lead. Spirit of knowledge, listen, is not intellectual knowledge, like the secular word means, but experiential knowledge. Spirit of knowledge is experiential knowledge. It is not head knowledge. You can have someone, a Christian, who knows the Bible backwards and forwards and can quote you every place, every scripture in the Bible who does not experience intimate knowledge of God. And I've met them. Okay, so it's not head knowledge. It's experiential knowledge. The spirit of knowledge is knowing something through living experience of it working in your life. Spirit of knowledge is knowing something through living experience of it working in your life. It means intimate, first-hand knowledge of God's life as your own. It means, and this is an important definition, it means intimate, first-hand knowledge of God's life as your own. That's what we're talking about when we're talking about being intimate with God, knowing him as our as our life itself. Now, the Greek word for this kind of knowledge is oida, O-I-D-A. Again, probably Greek scholars would die if they heard my pronunciation of some of these Greek words. But it's O-I-D-A. You pronounce it the way you want, you want to do it. But oida knowledge means God's life has come forth from our hearts and is now flooding our souls. God's life, there's nothing quenching the Spirit, so God's life is free to come forth from our hearts and is now flooding our souls. Let's go back to, while you're writing, let me go back. You don't need to go back to this one. But chart three kind of shows. Okay, this is a perfect example of Oida knowledge. All right, God's life is in here in this person's heart, okay? And this person, because he's making right choices, that life is just able to flow forth. And what everybody sees out here in the soul, in the outward, is God's life. Not self-life, but God's life. God's love has become this person's love outside. God's thoughts have become this person's thoughts out on the outside. His <laughs> desires have become their desires. Oida knowledge is a mingling of two things. It's a mingling of two things, like a marriage relationship. We are not only to acknowledge God as our Savior and as our Lord, but listen, listen carefully to me. We're not only to acknowledge Jesus as our Savior and as our Lord, but we are to actually become one with him. One with him. Might be for five minutes, but that's okay. That's better than yesterday. Okay? You'll love it so much, you'll want to get back there. It's to actually become one with him. For me to live is Christ, and that's what, that's what it means. For me to live is to have Christ's life pour forth through me, become one life. One heart, one will, and one, one life with him. Remember, that's what agapio meant. Those that took the agapio study, we talked about the, the, the Greek word agapio means to totally give yourself over to something, to, to so bind yourself with it, you become one. Okay, so we bind ourselves with, with God and we actually become one. That's what consummates our marriage to Jesus. That's what consummates our marriage to Jesus. Okay, there are two ways, and try and follow me, because I think this will help put a lot of confusion into... Um, understanding for you. There are two ways you can know God. Two ways you can know God. Number one, you can know him as your Savior. And the Greek word for this kind of knowledge is gnosko. G-I-N-O-S-K-O. And again, the reason I give you the Greek words is so that when you come across knowledge or knowing in the Bible now, you pick up your strongs and you check it out. Which one it is it? You see, is it going to be Oida? You're going to know it's that experiential knowledge? Or is it Gnosko, which is beginning? Gnosko is beginning knowledge. I'll call it beginning knowledge from, from now on, so it's a little bit easier. But 
but the Greek word is gnosko. It means beginning knowledge. It's knowledge that you receive from reading books about God, from what you hear others tell you about God, okay, from what you hear from others about his faithfulness, about his love, <clears throat> about his mind. Okay, you're just hearing it from others. Best way to remember Gnosko knowledge or beginning knowledge is that it's knowledge with a lot of self-effort. It's knowledge with a lot of self-effort. I know when I first became a Christian, man, I was so excited. I got out there and I, you know, worked really hard. <clears throat> I'm out there working hard at it. You can know Jesus as Savior, okay, but you can, and you can still preserve self. Let me show you on chart four on that one. You can know Jesus as Savior. Here's chart four. We covered this. You don't have to look this up. This person is saved. This person knows Jesus as Savior. This person has the Spirit of the Lord in them. They have, they have God's life in their heart. But something is happening here at this choice point. They're choosing to make emotional choices and not faith choices. Therefore, it's self that comes out. They're preserving self. They still know Jesus, but they're preserving their self rather than allowing it to, you know, set the self aside and letting God to come forth. And we see this throughout the Christian body. The end result of this is captivity and imprisonment. Hosea 4, verses 6 says, Without intimacy, without experiential knowledge of God, it says, My people will go into captivity and be destroyed. You know, you won't know his love intimately. And we all need to know that love Intimately. That was double-mindedness. Same, same thing. An example. Let me give you an example of beginning knowledge that might help a little bit to put, in, put into perspective. A dear Christian sister of mine, who's, we'll call her Linda, she had a shaky marriage, and her husband um, was on the verge of leaving. And so she prayed really hard, and she prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed. And he finally did leave, and she prayed and she prayed, and God, she was convinced that God uh, told her that he was going to come back and that he would never leave again. Well, he did come back, but then he um, kind of got discontent and started thinking about leaving again. Well, she was so devastated because she was so convinced that God told her that he would never leave again. She was just convinced that he would never leave again. And so her faith evaporated when after a year and a half he did choose to leave again. <clears throat> she kept saying, you know, God really didn't hear my prayers and just circled right on down. Her faith was in the circumstances, not in God. Her faith was in what she could see and understand in her own understanding what was going on. Well, the husband decided to come back again. It was one of these back and forth. They're all over the Christian body. These were both Christians. He decided to come back again, okay, and this time my friend Linda decided, okay, I'm going to be in control. I'm not going to leave it up to God, okay? You know, I, I doubt God's faithfulness is what she's really saying. I need to be in control. Man, if you want to lose your husband fast, you be in control. <laughs> if you want your husband to come back fast, then you give it to God. But she hadn't learned that yet. She was she doubted his faithfulness. She had to be in control herself. She was afraid. She was afraid. And a lot of us are afraid because of the circumstances. She was afraid to turn it back to God because she thought she might lose her husband for good. This is beginning knowledge of God. All right? She didn't know him experientially. She didn't know his faithfulness. She didn't know his love. She didn't know his trustworthiness experientially. She knew it here, but it didn't help her any when it got down to where we live in the nitty-gritty. She has to know it experientially. If she really knew God experientially, she would know his character, how he's totally trustworthy, how he's totally faithful. Now, what you see might not fit together, but you're, you have to set your understanding aside and say, God, I don't see what you're doing. It's a mess as far as I'm concerned. This is a contrary choice, but I choose to trust you. I choose to trust you in this. I give you my body to work through it. Okay, and then God is free to go ahead and work the situation out according to his will. 
Linda is like so many Christians that I come across today. They can't quite prog- progress beyond beginning knowledge of God because they can't quite trust God enough to lay themselves totally down at his feet. You follow what I'm saying? They're afraid and they feel they must stay in control themselves. You know what it goes back to? It goes back to the same thing we talked about in the way of agape. It goes back to that they really, number one, don't know that God loves them. They know it here. Here's this head knowledge. It says it all throughout the Bible that he loves me. But they don't know it down in their experience, in their feet. They don't have living experience that God loves them. Therefore, they don't trust him enough to lay their wills and their lives down moment by moment. Therefore, I mean, one thing leads to another. Therefore, they're not going to experience his love through them, his life through them, not only for others, but for themselves. Therefore, and the end result of that is God's arms you know, are tied. He can't work in that situation because they're in control and they're in the way. Do you see what I'm, do you see what I'm saying? One thing leads, le- leads to another. There needs to be a starting point. There needs to be a time when by faith, not feeling it at all, let's make those contrary choices, you choose to lay your will down to him irregardless of what's going on. Okay? And you just say, I don't feel it, I don't want to, I don't think it will work, but nevertheless, I choose to lay, to trust you with this circumstance. To me, it's a mess and I want to get in there and fix it, but I've seen that I've fixed it for 20 years and it's gotten worse. So I, that's usually that cornering when you finally say, I'm drowned in God, there's nothing else. Do you have something in mind? You know, and then we finally give it over to him. I think if we could do that right first off, he wouldn't have to put us in those corners. You know, if we could just lay it all down. But then that frees God. Listen to me. That begins to free God then to begin to manifest his love to you and show you his handprint in all the circumstances of your life. And you begin to see God in everything that you do. It seems to me the more contrary choices I make, the more intimacy with God I have. The more contrary choices I make in my own life, the more intimacy, the more of God's love I experience. Because flesh does not, flesh and spirit war, continually war, no matter how mature you are in the Lord, they're continually warring. So a lot of the times I don't feel like the choices I need to make. But somebody asked me a couple of weeks ago, Nancy, do you always make the right choice? Well, I've learned that I've tried every other road there is, and that's why I'm sharing with you, quit trying the other roads. There is no other road. I've gone down every other road. The only one that works is to totally lay it down and lay it down fast, right at the beginning. And then it allows God to be free in that situation to work it together for good. And you might not see it, You know, it might be hindsight. You go, oh, yeah, you had total control. But during it, you know, it's by faith that you walk. So beginning knowledge of God is knowing Christ as Savior, but not as your life itself. Beginning knowledge of God is knowing Christ as Savior. You know, you talk about it, but it's not knowing him as your life itself. Now let's talk about OEDA knowledge, number two. First was beginning knowledge. Let's talk about now uh, experiential knowledge. Knowing Christ as our life itself, becoming one with him is a totally different kind of knowledge. And this is what the mind of Christ wants to give us. This is the sixth function of the mind of Christ. Listen to Job 42.5. Job chapter 42 verse 5 says, I have heard of thee by the hearing of my ear. In other words, that was a beginning knowledge that Job had of God. And then he goes on to say, but now mine eye sees thee. Okay? Whole different kind of knowledge. You see God in every single situation of your life. The Greek word oida comes from a root word that means to see, which is exciting. To intimately know Jesus means to see him in everything. Every circumstance, good or bad, You see his face, you see his love, you see his handprint, his faithfulness, his trustworthiness. Remember the Old Testament saints? It says in Hebrews 11, 
They endured because they saw him who was invisible. Did you ever read that scripture? The only reason that the Old Testament saints were able to endure is because they saw him who was invisible. That's a neat scripture. And I think it's Hebrews 11.27. I have a question. Let me give you an example. About two or three years ago, we went to Israel. And uh, several of the people uh, in Israel got sick. They got the stomach flu and they were quite quite ill. And then when we got, I was fine during the trip, but when I got back, I had some residue. I just, my stomach just wasn't feeling good. I just couldn't hold anything down. And I hadn't had a, a checkup in quite a number of years. So I decided, well, I'll just use this as an excuse to go and get a checkup and get a physical and get all right again. So I went to see my regular doctor, and he says, well, I think we better have an upper GI. It sounds like maybe something, maybe there's an ulcer or something in there. It's not, not doing right. So he sent me to um, to uh, the x-ray technicians, and and you know when they find something. You know, you're laying there on this hard thing, and one guy comes in, turns you one way, and he points, and then, he tur- and then another guy comes in, and they turn, and they point this way, and, you know, and, and all the time you're going... Could you tell me what's going on? Oh, your doctor will get to you. Your doctor will tell you, you know. So uh, I went home, and I expected to hear from my doctor. And unfortunately, when I was out, he left a message on the answering machine, and it was really cute. It was a typical doctor. It said, nothing's to be concerned about. Everything is fine. But would you come in and have a CAT scan tomorrow? (laughs) Like, you know, great. So... Anyway, um, I was I went to have. Everybody ever had CAT scans? That I think the stuff you drink is worse than the CAT scan itself. That's oh, that was awful. So I went in there and I'm laying on this table and they're doing this 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 scan and I finally asked one of the technicians. I said, "It's been three days," and I said, "I know they found something, but my doctor won't tell me what it is. Would you please tell me? You know, have you found something? What what's the problem?" And he he was opposite of my doctor. He looked at me straight in the eye and he says, yeah, we found a growth the size of a baseball and we're not sure if it's malignant or not. And I went, great, thank you so much for telling me. <laughs> you know, he needs some of my doctor and my doctor needs some of him. They'll balance each other out. But anyway, on the way home from the hospital, I, um, you know, I seem to be able, I don't know about you, but I seem to be able to handle, handle the biggies okay. It's the little ones that I have the problems with. I mean, this one was out of my control, right? You know, and so on the way home, I'm just saying, God, this body is your body, and, you know, it's, it's, it belongs to you. And as a sideline here, it's, and this is important to this story, I had been asked to teach my first class in four years. I had been in the backwoods, put in the backwoods for four years to learn this material experientially. And um, I had been asked to come out and teach my first class back east, and I was praying whether it was God's timing for me to come out and teach this class. So that was really on my mind. I, I'd been praying hard about it. So I just told the Lord in the car, I said, and besides, Lord, if you want me to teach that class, you've got to keep this body well. you know." So I praised him and sang, sang songs to him. And inside, I know that God would not allow anything into my life that was not for my best. I know that from living experience of that. I've seen over and over and over again that whatever he allows in my life, he's going to use for his purposes. Well, when I got home, there was a phone call for me. And um, it had been maybe I'd been home three minutes and this phone rang and it was a girl from back east. I have never met this girl in my entire life. And um, we chit-chatted a little bit. She'd heard the Way of Agape series and they had just moved out to... Uh, actually, she lived back east, but she'd just moved out to the West Coast and wondered if we could go to lunch and we were chatting that way. And then all of a sudden she said, Nancy, she said, um, um, God has given me the gift of prophecy and I believe I have a prophecy for you. I'd never met this lady. She didn't know where I had just five minutes before come from and she's asking if I would like to hear a prophecy from God. And I said, oh, I'd love to. Please go ahead. So she began to read this prophecy and the first part was very general and very... Um, exhorting, I know, you know, where you are, don't fear, um, everything is going to be all right. But then he goes on, and I'm going to quote to you what he tells me, um, intimate knowledge of God. He, he goes on and he says, I have heard your cries, and your prayers have come before me as sweet-smelling savor. Do not hold back, for I have prepared you for such a time as this. Uh, t- talking about the teaching, remember, I was more concerned about this teaching. 
I will bless you with wisdom and knowledge as you teach and minister to my children. I will do exceedingly above all you have asked and thought possible. I will show myself mighty on your behalf. I will move through you, giving you all that you need to minister to my children. Now, my beloved, go and feed my sheep. Now, this lady did not know that I had been praying about going to teach. She didn't know that I had just come from the hospital where they said you might have a growth the size of, of a baseball. She knew nothing like that. I started jumping up and down. I was crying. I was jumping up and down. The phone rang, and it was the doctor saying it's benign. And I said, you don't have to tell me that. I knew it. I knew it, you know. Total abandonment of yourself to Jesus. Total abandonment of yourself. See him perform what's totally impossible for you. Lay it down to him. Let him bless you out of your socks. Your life becomes an absolute adventure. Knowing that you can't do anything, that he has to do it all. It's the most exciting and the most wonderful thing in my entire life, and it's the whole meaning of our existence. Not only to know Jesus is my friend, and as my Lord, and as my Savior, and as my husband, and as my lover, and all those things, but to know him as my life itself. Nothing in this whole world can compare to the fulfillment and the meaning that means in our lives. And that's where we all need to, to get to. I've seen over and over and over and over again God's faithfulness to me. In, in all the trials that he has allowed into my life, and I've been through one in the last, say, three or four months, that has been a really, really big trial. And I've just kept choosing contrary choice, contrary choice. Days I'd be flat on my face saying, I don't see how you're going to work this one out. But I choose to trust you to do it. And as of yesterday, and it looks like in the next couple of days, God is giving us an answer to that particular trial. And I just praise him. And I tell you, he is faithful. He is trustworthy. You can't see it. It's not through your eyes. It's through his mind if you just choose to trust him, he'll give you that fullness of knowledge that we all are just desperate for. Proverbs 24, 3 through 4 says, Through wisdom a house is built, by understanding it's established, but by knowledge, and that's this, this intimate kind of knowledge, shall the chambers be filled with all precious and pleasant riches. So it's by intimate knowledge of God. It's Proverbs 24, 3 through 4 that says that all the chambers will be filled with precious and pleasant riches. Intimate knowledge of Christ is the climax of our relationship with him. We finally let go of self, and we've been filled with his life. Let go of self-life, and we've been filled with his life. And I'm sorry to not be able to tell you, then you'll stay that way the rest of your life. It's moment second by second second by second. You let go of the self-life and you're filled with Jesus' life. But like I said, it's so glorious and you know it's so supernatural that you'll want to get back there. Now let's talk about the last function of the mind of Christ, which is walking in the fear of God. What is the fear of the Lord? We hear that so much, especially throughout the Old Testament. The real purpose of the mind of Christ, the ultimate purpose, the the reason he's given us his mind is for us to be able to walk in the fear of God and not in the fear of man. Isaiah 11, verse 3, tells us that the whole purpose of the mind of Christ is not only to give us intimate knowledge of God, which is critically important, but now to be able to walk in that intimate knowledge. You don't want just the intimate knowledge in the prayer closet. You want to be able to take that intimate knowledge out and walk so that your husbands and your children and your friends and, and your employers see that intimacy. They see Jesus in you. So fear of God means two things. You might want to take these two down. It means essentially two things. Number one, to stand in reverential awe of who God is. To stand in reverential awe of who God is. And number two, to hate sin. And when I say sin, just put in parentheses there anything that separates me from God. Hate anything that separates me from God because it's going to quench that spirit and it's self-life that's going to come forth. 
Now, you can't reverentially stand in awe of who God is until you know him, right? Until you know his faithfulness, until you have that intimacy. And you can't really know God, you know, have that intimacy unless you hate sin, anything that quenches the spirit. So knowing God and walking in the fear of God, again, these last two functions go hand in hand. Okay, one leads you to the other, and the other rests upon the first. Fear of God is not fearfulness of God. It's not being, ooh, shaking in your boots. Yes, he's a holy God, and there is a reverence that we need to have for him, but it's not fearfulness of him. Fear of God is walking and speaking in such an intimate and personal relationship with God that you're in continual awe of what he's doing in your life. And I can say that in my own life. I just sometimes watch and go, Oh, you know, I didn't know you could do I didn't know that's what you were doing. It's continual awe of who he is and what he's doing personally in each of your lives. He cares of every hair on your head. He cares about every thought you think. You know, he's, somebody said, well, I'll just give him the big things. Try the little things. The little things. What you're to wear. Where you're to park. Have him in your mind the whole time. And anyway, when you're in continual awe of watching him work in your life, then you're going to flee anything that's going to quench that relationship. See, it becomes automatic. You just love, you see him, and you just love having him work, so you're watching continually for anything that's going to quench that relationship. Fear of the Lord is walking in God's truth. It's walking in God's love. This is the genuine Christian. Will a real Christian please stand up? We have so many phonies in our, in our bodies. And it's not that they don't, you know, they need to be phonies. It's just that they're out there on self-life doing all the things that they're doing. Okay, so this is the genuine curse. There's no hypocrisy. No masks. These people are free to be themselves. And yet at the same time reflect Christ. Incredible freedom. Be open so you can say, I'm, you know, I'm sinking today. I need your prayers. Be real. Don't be, don't put on the facade. But at the same time, they'll be able to see and experience God's love and God's mind. Walking in the fear of the Lord doesn't mean somehow you're perfect or sinless. Please start that. Doesn't mean that you're perfect or sinless. Usually far from it. Our self-life does not improve with age. We've said that, and it's so important. You can be a Christian 40 years, and your self-life is going to be still as ugly as the day you first became a believer. What improves with age is the ability to recognize that self and make the appropriate choices to give it over. That's all maturity in Christ is. Recognizing when you blow it, recognizing the pride, recognizing the doubt, choosing to give it over and staying that open vessel. That's what maturity is. Do it faster. Do it faster. Walking in the fear of God means you're still having to deal moment by moment with hurts, with wounds, negative thoughts. And you know what? The closer it seems that I get to Jesus, the more sin I see in me. Because now we're going for the real root motives. Now we're going for the junky stuff down here. You know, I've maybe dealt with a lot of those, those surface things I can catch. But I can't believe what he brings up from down here, okay? Disobedience, the doubt, the pride, okay? But also you're able to catch it faster and make faith choices faster because you know instantly when something quenches the spirit. You know instantly when you switch to self-gear or God's gear. You know, I know instantly when it's the, the puke that comes out of me. And sometimes I, sometimes I want to carry around a flag you know, and say, stop, just a minute, got to get clean. Then I'll come back and finish the conversation. Don't you ever feel that way? You know, you're yelling and screaming at your kids on the way driving them to school, and then you meet somebody at school, and you put on this smile, and you're this wonderful, glorious person. I've had to call people back and say, cross that out. Okay, I'm clean now. Now I can talk to you, you know. Seriously, you'll get so you hate it. That's hating sin. Praise God, that's hating sin. Because the relationship is so precious, and you know when it's God, and then you know when it's, it's yourself. One of the most beautiful examples of someone who walked in the fear of the Lord is a dear friend of mine called her name Diana Bantlow. 
And I think I told some of you about her in The Way of Agape. But I just really want to broadcast her throughout the country. She was, I think of all the people, all the Christians I've ever know, known, she is one that's way up there, uh, walking in the fear of the Lord. She was only two years a Christian. She was a woman's liber, beautiful 28-year-old girl, beautiful girl, woman's lib, but when she accepted Christ, it's like everything was laid down at his feet instantly. I mean, instantly she was just walking in this kind of a really intimate relationship with the Lord. Um, um, she, when she was 28 years old, she uh, got ill and went to the doctor, and the doctor diagnosed leukemia and gave her six months to live. She had two small children. Her one little girl was probably three or four, and her other little girl was about a year old. <clears throat> she, um, if it probably had been you or I, we probably would have spent all of our time, just gone into our house. We had a beautiful husband that adored her. We probably would have just gone into our house, spent all of our time with our kids and our husband. Someone asked if she'd teach a Bible study. And, you know, if you're only two years old as a Christian, that's pretty young. That's pretty normally to, to take on a Bible study. She said she'd pray about it, and she prayed about it, and she felt it was really God's will that she would be out there teaching the study. Study started at ten people, but by the time um, she was finished with it, we were up to about 50, 60 people, because she would go to her chemo- chemotherapy treatments, you know, and then come directly to the Bible study, We'd prop pillows up around her so that she could sit comfortably, you know, as all this was going through her. And she would sit on that couch, and I'll never forget. I was 15 years in the Lord at that time. And I heard Diana talk about an intimacy with Jesus Christ that I didn't know. She talked about his love. She talked about his faithfulness personally from the depth of her heart, coming right from where you know that she knows where she's going to go in six months. And talking about his faithfulness, his love, his compassion, his trustworthiness. I mean, all of us just sat there just glued because we wanted what she had. She had an intimacy and she walked in a fear of God, didn't allow anything to quench that relationship. And you know she experienced fear. You know she experienced negative thoughts. You know with a husband that adored her and her two small children... You know, she was not superhuman. You know she had those thoughts, but she didn't let anything quench that relationship with the Lord. More than any other Christian that I have ever known, she walked in the fear of the Lord. Malachi 3, verse 16 says, There's a book of remembrance written for those that fear God. And I bet you my friend Diana Bentlow will be at the top of the list. Now, she wasn't miraculously healed. Although she went to the church elders three times, she had many, many people pray for her. She had faith to move mountains. And yet somehow God knew that the witness of his life through her, through this trial, was going to be greater than had he just supernaturally. He chose to do it this way. And I'll tell you, she affected hundreds of lives. She gave testimonies in churches like two weeks before God took her home. I mean, she just was an incredible witness of God's life. As it came closer to Christmas, I think it was June when the leukemia was diagnosed, and as it came closer to Christmas, she was confined to the hospital, and uh, she began to tell people that she was sure that God was going to allow her to go home for Christmas Day. Now, home, she meant to her two little children and to her precious husband. But Christmas Day, 1974, God took her to the home that he had prepared for her, from the beginning of of creation. As I've shared Diana's story throughout the country, and it's a it's a glorification of the Lord, people have come up to me and said, Diana touched my life. I've heard her tapes, or I've heard this, or I've heard this. In particular, there were two nurses that came up to me, and they said, we have to tell you about Diana. We attended Diana the last two weeks of her life in the hospital. And they said, let me tell you, most cancer patients, terminally ill cancer patients, are two extremes. One will be totally out of it. You know, they just totally um, have so much medication they can't keep on track. Or the other ones are full of fear, you know, and ranting and raving as, as death approaches. And they said they'd go into Diana. These were non-believers at the time. They'd go into Diana to give her her pain medication. 
And even though her little emaciated body and no hair and all that, she'd look up with these radiant eyes to these two nurses and she'd say, no, thank you. She'd say, my Lord is taking care of me. And may he bless you. And can I pray for you? And these nurses were just like, they could not, they could not believe it. They saw in Diana a love and a joy and a peace that passed all human understanding. And because of Diana, both of those nurses came to Jesus Christ. They saw, they both came to Christ as a result of seeing Christ's life through Diana even though she was dying. Incredible story. Remember I said last night, peace and, last time, peace and joy and love does not come with the absence of trials, but with the presence of Jesus. The presence of Jesus. And those nurses saw the presence of Jesus in spite of where Diana was. This is the transformed life that God desires in every one of us, no matter where we're walking, no matter what he's allowed in your life. He wants to touch your kids. He wants to touch your husband. He wants to touch others. He wants Jesus' life to shine forth through you, through your circumstances, whatever he's allowed, walking in intimate knowledge of God, no matter how you feel, what others say, no matter what your circumstances are, glorifying, letting him shine forth, and magnifying him. It's the purpose of our whole Christian life. Walking in the fear of the Lord is the culmination of the mind of Christ in us. Proverbs 2, verses 2 through 5 says, If you will incline your ear to wisdom, if you will apply your heart to understanding, if you will cry after knowledge and lift up your voice for understanding, and seek her as silver and search for her as for hidden treasures, then... You shall understand the fear of the Lord and have knowledge of God. Therefore, my precious sisters, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. How? By the renewing of your minds, by putting off the old stuff and putting on the mind of Christ so that then you can prove in your life actions what is the good and the perfect will of God, just like Diana did. Let's pray. Jesus Christ, all of our tears are for you. Because we all desire, Father, to have the kind of intimacy that Diana had. And I know it's your desire for us, too, to have that intimacy and to walk in that fear of you that others will see and just want. It's contagious, Father. They want that, Lord Jesus. So teach us, Father, how to be intimate with you. Help us to put into practice some of these things, Father. Help us to catch each thought. Give it over to you so we can stay those open and cleansed vessels, Father, so you can be made manifest through us and not self. God, we want to be genuine representations of you. We want to walk in the truth. Begin today in each of our lives, each of our lives, to show us the things, Father, that quench your spirit and that prevent our knowing you in the way that you want us to know you. Father, we want all of you, we want to know you as our life itself. So Jesus, do what you have to do in each of our lives to make us like you. And we pray and we give you glory for what you're going to do. We thank you for this incredible abundant life that's ours for the asking. In Jesus' name, amen.